Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick, and with me is the person who I think is the most excited for the Zack Snyder Justice League cut, Mackenzie. Uh, hi. <laughs> Don't know what to do that intro, but okay. I just decided to wing it, and it's the first thing that came to mind, because I think you're the only person who's talked to me about it. And I hate it. I think it's I think it's releasing on the day that we're recording this episode. I don't know. I don't care. Honestly. I'd rather just talk about I'd rather talk about stuff that matters. Like Acadia. Yeah, exactly. Like this four hundred year old community. <laughs> So yeah, exactly. As Mac mentioned, today we're going to be covering, for the first time on the show, Acadians. Specifically a moment in their history that'll roughly cover from the mid-1600s up until the 1840s and the aftermath of that. And we're going to see a bit why later. Before we get into the show, though, just a quick reminder that you can support us materially through stuff like Patreon, through PayPal, and just general reviews. If you want to leave a review, for example, on iTunes, preferably a five-star review, if you please, that definitely helps boost the show and it helps keep us going and it tells us what you like to listen to. You can listen to the end of the show for more about those. Ooh. So starting us off, classic question, what do you know about Acadia, Mac? very little even in school again in quebec high school you don't talk a lot about acadia no indeed you don't i know so, acadians i know people from acadia but oh, okay that's about it yeah same i know one person from acadia <laughs> and it's the nova scotian type we'll get to the mm -hmm. differences later Essentially, kicking us off, Acadia, or Acadie, as it was known for a long time, and still is to some extent, essentially, as a territory, covers what we now know as the Maritime Provinces, the Gaspé right. region, and what is modern-day New England, so like Maine and the northeastern coast of the United States. Like, it's quite an interesting territory. For sure. And... Essentially, it started off as, well, obviously native territory, but as it was known as Acadie, it was a region that was claimed by the French in the 17th century, right? You can even get references to it as far back as Samuel de Champlain, but it was first actually permanently settled by the French by the 1630s, so a bit after Champlain's time. By the 17th century, the French had covered that region, as well as places like Newfoundland and the Hudson's Bay. So that gives you an idea of where they are, and they were starting to move into what was known as New France. And we're not going to be talking about New France today necessarily, but you know it's important to kind of situate ourselves about these places. So much like many of the colonies at the time, Acadia kind of had a rough start, but despite its small size, it would actually be quite prosperous, right? And they've been noted, the people who settled in that area, uh, to use actually complex irrigation systems that they would have called aboiteaux, um, which basically is an irrigation system that would reclaim the marshlands of that area into prosperous farmland. Like, it was actually a very ingenious source that I'm not going to get into the details here, but just kind of gives a sense of what we're talking about. It would only actually be by the end of the 17th century that the French that had settled there would start using the name Acadien or Acadians. Right? Much right around the same time as the people who were settling in New France right, would start calling themselves the Canadiens. So it takes a couple generations, but... Ultimately, we already start to see the development of a community that's kind of independent and recognizes itself as distinct from not only the people in New France, but the French motherland, so to speak. And at this time, in the end of the 17th century, we're talking about a thousand people in the entire settlement. Not very big, but you still get some important places like Port Royal, which is now Annapolis Royal, uh, and Grand Prix. Do you know why they're called Acadians? Like, where does the name come from? I actually don't know. So, I remember looking it up one time, like, where the name Acadie comes from, and the mm -hmm. Acadie. If I remember correctly, I should have written it down, but if I remember correctly, it was basically, like many things in North America, a def a deforming of native words. Like, that's one of the assumptions, right? Is right. that there was the rivière l'Acadie. 
um, or the uh, Akedzi River. And that's what it was called according to the natives. And that kind of devolved into the name for the entire territory and uh, eventually the population. So it's like a smaller version of Canada and why we're called Canadians. Yeah, except I think much like the name Canada, it's kind of a contentious thing because it's not like people, it's not the kind of thing that people wrote down specifically why, or when they did write it down, it kind of contradicts other sources. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit difficult to be sure about it. But I, if I remember like off the top of my head, that's one of the reasons why. To give a little preview of what we're going to be talking about later, folks, Acadians are all over the place. We have sort of this idea that they're sort of in the maritime provinces, but again, Lots of them in Louisiana, Maine, Texas. There's obviously, there's going to be some who live in Quebec, Ontario. This is a large group of people and it's a large culture. Oh yeah, definitely. And there are like historic reasons as to why they are all over the place outside of just natural population movements. <laughs> there's some foreshadowing for you. Oh, big time. And we can start talking about it a bit now because... Obviously, on the North American territory, we didn't just have the French. In what would become Canada, they were definitely prevalent, but they weren't alone. And we obviously had the presence of the English, or as they would later become known not long after this period, actually, the British. Um, so the English were actually already in the early 18th, a lot more powerful than the French on the territory. Right? Mm -hmm. And they would be in conflict with the French in this vague area of Acadia, New France, almost from the get-go. Right? And in 1710, there would actually be a conflict between the French and the English, one that we don't really talk about a lot, but which ended up with the conquest of the little settlement of Port Royal which again, as the name implies, is a port city. And so it creates quite a tactical advantage for the British to have that town there, right? Or that settlement. I, I don't think it was big enough to actually call it much of a town. <laughs> um, and this kind of conflict, while not massive, would go back and forth, conquests, reconquests. The usual. The usual. And one of the major achievements, I guess, militarily for the British around this time would come in 1713 when they would kind of defeat the French once and for, once and for all in the Acadian region. And this is where we would have what's called the Treaty of Utrecht, which is essentially a treaty that signs over to the English all these former French colonies, namely Newfoundland, the Hudson's Bay area, Acadia, and again, it kind of foreshadows what would happen to New France, but 50 years earlier, exactly 50 years earlier, actually. Um, so yeah, the English kind of take over these maritime possessions from the French. This obviously doesn't end the conflict in any way, shape, or form. The French would still try to keep gaining back these lost colonies, <laughs> but... For all intents and purposes, the British are pretty solid in securing their hold on the Maritimes for the foreseeable future. Now, one of the issues, and this is where the Acadians come back in, one of the issues with these conflicts right, is that once the British take over, one of the deals, I guess, that they make with the Acadians is that they agree to leave them alone. Right? They're even called the neutral French. Right? Because they still f speak French, they're still there, we acknowledge their presence, but they're officially part of the British Empire now. Mm -hmm. So we tell them, okay, as long as you don't bear arms against us, and as long as you don't join the French, or the Mi'kmaq, who are associated with the French also, as long as you just stay quietly, right, we're not going to touch you. We're going to keep going, we're going to mostly concentrate on our American colonies, because those are a bit more prosperous. Just a little bit. Just as tad, right? However, this would become increasingly difficult for the Acadians because both the French in New France and the English in Acadia would mutually try to expand, right? which would inevitably cause the kind of tensions along the borders that would inevitably form alongside New France and the Maritime Provinces, what the British would mostly call Nova Scotia, the entire area. And as tensions became hotter and hotter between the French and English, mostly in the 1740s and 50s, there came to be increasing pressure on the Acadians to join one or the other. Because by this point, they were numbering around 5,000 men, right? Men that were able to fight. 
at this time, right, we, we tend to imagine like these big armies, but at this time, 5,000 definitely made a difference. Oh, for sure. Especially, especially in these sort of uh, colonies. Absolutely, right? You, where you have difficulty, especially in the northern colonies where you have a lot of difficulty gaining people. And it's, it's the similar thing as when we were talking about uh, Europeans having natives on their side, right? It's people that know the, the territory, right? And that are on the border. So you get 5,000 ready to fight men or able to fight. They're not necessarily ready. They don't want to. Right? <laughs> you get these 5,000 men who know the territory, who are on the border. They know they, where to fight and when to fight. Exactly. So there's a lot of pressure from both the French and the English. Right? And as might be expected, the British are able to put a bit more pressure on the Acadian community just because they are stronger. They're there. And they're there, right? Exactly. And so New France is starting to care less and less about New France and starting to care more about their other holdings. Yeah, namely in the Caribbean. Yeah. So got to get that sugar. I mean, you really do. How else? What else are you going to put in your coffee that's also produced by slaves? It's all produced by slaves. <laughs> it's really it. Anyway. Basically, the principal opinion of the British in this case is that uncon anything other than unconditional military support by the Acadians in their fight against the French would be tantamount to treason. It doesn't matter that they're also Catholic like the French. It doesn't matter that they also speak the same language. It doesn't matter that they have similar cultural origins. None of that matters. You're not fighting with us. You are considered a traitor. Thanks, Britain, for just being the worst. Yeah. And kudos to the Acadians, by the way. A lot of them will still refuse to give their full support, despite the fact that the British conquer more and more areas, namely uh, the settlement of Beauséjour, which was another kind of notable settlement of Acadians. They would fully take it over. And nonetheless, the Acadians... By and large, some did, but by and large, a lot of them just said no. Like, we're not, we're not helping you. We don't agree with this. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll give you three attempts to guess what happened to the wonderful people of Akedzi in the aftermath of this very condensed history of their... Being kind of conquered and attacked and forced and pressured. Mm -hmm. um, the Brits saw the error of their ways and then left to go live in peace and harmony with the Acadians, and then went home to fix their child labor issues and stop being dicks. I mean, really, we can end the episode right here because there's no literature to talk about, obviously. That's, that's exactly what happened. Thanks. For Everybody was here. the best. Everybody just decided to be nice, finally. Yeah. What actually happened is yes. kind of what's known as one of... It, it still kind of resonates today in maritime history. We'll see more about that later, but... Basically, one of the more, I would say, brutal episodes um, in early British colonial history in Canada. Obviously, that's saying something. That's saying something, but it's brutal for what it represents, I think, rather than like the actual like gory brutality, because there are plenty of examples of that. But basically, because of the constant resistance of the Acadians, from 1755... For about a period of eight years, until the British fully take over in North America in 1763, mm -hmm. the British would proceed to deport and actively remove the Acadians from their community, from their home, right? They had settled there. <sighs> Say what you will about the initial act of settlement, but they, at that point, had considered Acadia home, and the British were like, nope, you refuse to, ac to accept our domination. It's not even that they refuse to accept, they just don't want to fight in your fucking wars. But that's, that's not acceptable, Mac. You know that. <laughs> Jesus. So from 1755 to 1763, we would have what would essentially become known as the Acadian deportation, in which the numbers are kind of fuzzy at times, but we estimate that approximately 10 to 12,000 Acadians would be removed from their home and spread out across the British North American colonies. No, oh, they were sent to a nice big farm to live. Oh my God. With giant fields to play in. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure some found their way onto farms, but oof. But they, they didn't actively kill them. They just moved them, right? Yeah. That's not to say that a lot of them didn't die. It's estimated that about 30% of them would die on the trip to places such as Louisiana, such as New England, uh, and all kinds of 
American colonies. And then another and, 30%. <laughs> yeah, exactly. About another 30% are considered, are estimated to have died once they reached destination. Obviously, these are more estimates than anything else. It could be more, it could be less because of the nature of documentation at the time, what survives, what doesn't, what was even written down in the first place. But even if you're taking a really conservative estimate, say like 20%, it's horrifying. And part of that is just the nature of living in the colonies at the time. I don't think it's specific to the Acadians, but any person who would be displaced forcefully like that would have to go through significant hardships. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we're getting at with the Acadians. Yeah, no, it's because it, well, people have to understand when the Acadians were being moved, they weren't just being moved to, they would be moving multiple times because they were moved in waves, right? And so the second wave, they were deported to England and France. And then they were removed from there again. And think they, this time they were given incentives to do so by the Spanish government. And that's how they ended up in places like Louisiana. Yeah, that's so, a very good point. Yeah, definitely. And it was, what makes it even worse is you have to remember crossing the ocean at this time is not a luxury journey. No, of course not. It, it takes is. months. It's horrible. It's sticky and wet and everything's really gross. You have to be, you're forced to drink lime juice all the time so you don't get scurvy and... You're probably missing out on a bunch of nutrients because they can't bring good food with them or else it rots. Yeah. Fun stuff. So yeah, just doing that trip back and forth is it would be would be horrendous in any day. Mm -hmm. But it, it kind of adds insult to injury. It well, not kind of, it straight up adds insult to injury when you're doing it forcefully for sticking to your guns. Right? Yeah. Now, obviously, the British would have a kind of different spin on it. Not one that's any less acceptable, mind you, but it, they don't necessarily frame it in a way that's indicating their military interests, right? Mm -hmm. it, it indicates a different interest, but <laughs> one that's not directly related to the military. And what I mean by this is that there are letters and articles that are written in journals at the time, namely one that I have pulled up here in 1755 from the New York Gazette, that kind of indicates how the British framed this expulsion of the Acadians. Right? Now, already in 1755, they're kind of indicating a different narrative. Um, as they do. As they do. And interestingly enough, we'll kind of come back to it in the literature that we're talking about. I think there's an interesting moment in that that we'll talk about. So let me quote here from the New York Gazette, 1755. I can't quote a writer uh, because it's an anonymous letter. So it says here, We are now upon a great and noble scheme of sending the neutral French out of the province. If we can effect their expulsion, it will be one of the greatest things that ever did the, Fr the English in America. For, by all accounts, that part of the country they possess is as good land as any in the world. So, what do you make of something <laughs> like this? <laughs> <laughs> it, God. England's nice to visit nowadays. When it's not raining, yeah, sure. Yeah, the English are good people these days, so it's better. Better, is it? Yeah. God, it's just, they possess is as good land as any in the world. Is it mm -hmm. really? Well, I mean, it kind of comes back to what we were saying, right? The use, they, they, they managed to make it better, yeah. right? By, by readapting the territory, they actually had true. apparently quite decent farmland, right? And they were right by the water. Like, y apparently you could make quite significant farming settlements right there. Right? I also like the phrase, we are upon a great and noble scheme. Yes. Okay. I was wondering if you were going <laughs> to talk about this. Go for it. It's... It speaks to that, again, that sort of social Darwinistic view mm -hmm. that we would start to see become more and more prevalent. Yep. But there's always been this belief that these people, the greater helps the lesser, which is in its own idea, in a vacuum, a good idea to have. You know, people with power should be helping those without. But then the way that the implementation comes about is just... Exactly. Oh, yeah. There, there's a complete disconnect between the rhetoric of it and the actual action of it. Right? It's just, they're, they're not, obviously, in case like we, you were, we weren't clear about our, the tone of our voice or by directly saying it, the British aren't helping the Acadians in any way, shape, or form here. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing it for, I mean, you, you could argue capitalistic purposes, right, of getting the land, although it wasn't quite uh, in that specific mindset. But it but, must be great and noble. Right, exactly. Right, you're you're doing it for 
that's some good PR right there. I'm just going to say yes, like that's the word I was looking for. The British Empire has some of the best PR of all time in this period. Mhm. They know how to sell an idea, sell an image, sell a sell a sound bite almost. Absolutely. And it comes at a specific moment, right? This is 1755 to the 1760s. It's coming out at a moment where, you know, you can much more easily control the narrative. A lot of the newspapers at the time were not necessarily privately owned. They, mm-hmm. they, there were some, but a lot of them were government mandated, essentially pamphlets. And the private ones are pretty easy to buy out. Sure. Not but, everybody's going to be like our boy, uh, what's his name? The one who fought for freedom of the press. Joseph Howe. There you go. Not everybody's going to be an upstanding free press kind of person like Joseph Howe. Especially not when you're actively trying to establish an empire, right? This is still in the relative early days of empire in North America, right? So we're actively trying to justify this kind of action, even though there is some noted resistance to it, but it's this kind of thing. It's definitely this kind of narrative and expression that completely helps in Mm -hmm. the way that the British take over, right? Is the use of these relatively new technologies of newspaper and publication, Mm -hmm. of mass uh, publication, I should say, (laughs) at a time when like not a lot of people could read or like the dissemination of information was relatively limited. I don't know. I thought it was a really interesting section that kind of definitely shows the two sides of a coin, right? How, what actually happened of like the military conquest and a war, imperial war versus like giving a human spin kind of (laughs) on deportation. A human, it's humane. We're deporting them to, 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 to bed, to a nice big farm. I mean, Louisiana is warm sometimes. So cool. And it's got it's got exotic things like crocodiles or right. alligators, one of the two. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Scaly things with big teeth. So anyway, in so this would basically continue as you said there it kind of goes in waves. The major one happens in 1755, 1756. That's when yeah. about I think if I remember correctly, I didn't write it down. It was about 8,000 were deported in one shot. Mm-hmm. And from there it's a couple hundred at the at a time. But this would essentially continue until, as we said, the Royal Proclamation would basically secure British hegemony in North America, or at least in Eastern North America. Yeah, North America. In 1764, this kind of deportation or, or uh, yeah, active deportation would be lifted and the Acadians would be allowed to come back to what, be, what was known as Nova Scotia again. It's kind of a mixed bag because once again by then they had probably already settled or not probably they had surely already settled in different places in north america so it's kind of a hard pill to swallow to then uplift uh, uproot your home again and then just come back but in 1764 they're able to come back there's no actual restrictions by then it's estimated that they number about a thousand in the area Mm -hmm. well i mean if we take a look at the wave so when was the second wave so I think it came around 17, 1758, if I remember correctly. Okay, so 1758, they get sent to uh, England slash France, and then they get sent to uh, Louisiana by the Spanish. Mm-hmm. That's too much traveling. Yeah. You're not going to, especially in this time, you're not going to want to uproot your life at that point. It's, it's too little too late to say, you know? Yeah, definitely. Like, ugh. It's like we're we're gonna we're gonna get into like more fun stuff later, but I I, I fear this is like the the, the kind of sad part of the <laughs> of the episode. His darkest before the dawn. Yeah, it gets so, real fun. We're gonna rip apart another poet. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, were you mentioning like they they essentially settle in other places, including Louisiana, right? The Spanish and all that that you were just mentioning. We were talking about this before we started recording. This is kind of the origin of what we would know as Cajuns. The French speakers of Louisiana, they are known as Cajuns often. This is kind of the origin of this population, was the initial deportation from Acadia and eventually returned to places like Louisiana, and it created a ostensibly completely new population that mixed in with this local slave population and English population and created a community in its own right. So before we move on to our actual literature, so this long form poem, 
Do you have any final thoughts about this setup for the expulsion of the Acadians? It's it's nothing new, mm-hmm. which is really sad to say. Yeah. It's 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 a, it's it's kind of horrible what happened to them. Not the mo- not again, not the most horrible thing that happened in North America by co- by the colonial powers that be. Yeah. But what's happening here this constant movement, constantly not letting people just live. Mhm is it's tragic absolutely it's kind of it's indicative also of like again horrible and you say that it's not the first time absolutely it is indicative however of a certain advantage that they have of being european based in that they weren't slaughtered they were at least moved i say that at least Mm -hmm. with the hugest air quotes like that i can imagine but there is nonetheless like there's a difference right that you can already see doesn't remove from the hor- horrifying nature of it, but I'm just saying, like, it's something to definitely take note of. So, if that's all, I think we can move on to our literature today. So we'll, you probably, we didn't mention it already what it was, but you probably know just by the title of the episode. Today we're going to be covering what is considered by many to be a kind of classic in American, Acadian, Canadian, depending on how you look at it, literature. <laughs> Even though today by modern standards, a lot of people kind of dismiss it. And we'll, t- we'll get into it why. But today we're talking about Longfellow's long poem, Evangeline. Exactly. So, have you ever had you ever heard of this work before? uh, No. No. But now I do. Now I know what it's about. So it's kind of interesting. So this book came out in 1847. So almost a hundred years after the actual expulsion. And I've heard of it. Right. I I knew that we had a copy at my grandmother's. This old copy that's like a hundred years old, but. I'd never read it. I'd heard vaguely of things here and there. I read it for this episode, and yeah. uh, oh boy, we're in for a treat for this one. It's yeah, no, I, I've again, like, I'm pretty sure I've heard of it before mentioned, mm-hmm. but never really understood. Yeah, but it, it follows a lot of similar poetry that we've been reading at the time. Mm-hmm. It's 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 a poet purporting to present a por- portion of the population perfectly in picturesque pantomime with appalling practiced poetic prose and poetry. Wow, where did you get that from? I wrote it out. I, I, I was writing it out while you were giving the history of Acadia. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's exactly perfect. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of how many P's I could think of. With- okay, wait, wait, wait. So, 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 say that again. So, Evangeline is about a poet purporting to present a portion of the population perfectly in picturesque pantomime with appalling practice, poetic prose and poetry. That is beautiful. I want that on a poster. Holy crap! <laughs> Thank you so much for that. <laughs> thing is, you can kind of fit that to almost so much travel literature. We'll dig into that later, but it makes my skin crawl. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll definitely come back to that. Before we get too deeply into it, just um, a kind of summary of the poem. Right. So Evangeline, as I said, was written by uh, Wordsworth Longfellow. Uh, sorry, Wadsworth Longfellow. And follows the titular Evangeline Bellefontaine, who is set to be married to her great love, Gabrielle La Jeunesse, who's the son of the mm-hmm. local blacksmith of Grand Prix, Nova Scotia. When suddenly their plans for eloping and living a happy life as simple farmers in Acadia is, hoist, is foisted sorry, by the English arriving one morning and exiling the French residents to what are quote unquote safer colonies. Now, obviously, the lovers are separated because it has to be more dramatic. And Gabriel and his father are sent to Louisiana. And Evangeline basically spends most of the poem looking for him. Right? Mm-hmm. Eventually, she does find him. Uh, like she, she, she finds, sorry, his father first. She finds Basil. And that kind of leads her on to other quests through Michigan, through basically the American East Coast. Mm -hmm. And she spends what are years of wandering and it causes her to become prematurely old in her search for her great love before finally finding 
Gabriel in Philadelphia during a pestilence, right? Yeah. She recognizes this old dying man as her former love. And, you know, she, she finds him, she spends the last moments with her, uh, with him, sorry. And he eventually dies and kind of the shock of his death eventually kind of kills her too. The, the ending, by the way, depends on the translation. It actually does change on the translation, but oh. ultimately the point is they both die it's after sad. having reunited the, and it's sad. They're buried together in a Catholic cemetery and the poem opens up with the Acadians kind of just move on and live happily ever after, after having been able to resettle on a nice their farm. Nova Scotia. Exactly. You read, because the prelude is, it starts at, it starts at the end. The prelude sort of gives the imagery of what's happening in Acadia after the great story and this great tragedy and expulsion of the Acadians. The very first line, this is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks bordered with moss and in garments green, indistinct in the twilight. I'm not reading this correctly, first of all, folks. I'm just going to let you know this poem is written in hexameter. Isn't it diaclectic hexameter? Uh, ah, diactic. Di yeah, diactic hexameter to imitate Greek and Latin classics. Yes. The major problem is Greek and Latin classics were about mythology. They were about stories that weren't actually real. So this man is taking a historical tragedy, fabricating a romance for it, and then trying to pass it off as some sort of great classic. Essentially, yeah. he made Pearl Harbor the film. Yeah, that's, yeah, that perfectly encapsulates it. Yeah, perfect. Do you, like, we'll, we'll get to the, the effects of the form I think we can get to it later after having like set up, but yeah, that's a definite way of, of going at it. Uh, I agree that it completely changes the way in which you read something like this. It adds some romanticism to it where well, there ostensibly shouldn't be. It's giving, it's trying to do like give a humanizing component in this conflict to sort of tell its tale. Mm -hmm. But again, it goes about it as well as the movie Pearl Harbor did. Which, if you haven't seen, watch it just for the horrifying, like, it's just the, the, for, for how the inaccuracy. it is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's, this actually, the, the more the more, more connections you make, the better, because, again, this isn't a bad looking movie, and it's not a well, it's not a poorly written poem. I will say this, this is very, like, beautiful imagery going on. It's yes. just, it's just talking about the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we'll get to kind of why he does that a bit later. Just for a bit of context on the writer and the creation of Evangeline, so Longfellow himself was born in Portland, Maine in 1807. So he's not actually Acadian, he's just an American. <laughs> he's, an usual. he's an usual. He's an Anglo-American. Canadians American. aren't actually writing about Canada. Yeah, exactly. Or Acadians about Acadia in this case. Yeah. So, and he was part of a group that became known as the Fireside Poets, right, who were Americans that kind of wanted to create, exactly as you were saying, this rather beautiful poetry, like ostensibly is quite nice, but poetry that could be literally told around a campfire, right, something that represents the more uh, human and, you know, the visceral imagery of the American people. They were trying to make American literature. Exactly. And they were trying to rival like popular British and really elitist poetry, like what they perceived as elitism within the po poetic institution, I guess. We're going to, we're going to beat the elitism by making more elitism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I, Reading this, not knowing that he was part of the Fireside Poets, I definitely would not have been able to say like, oh yeah, he's trying to create this more kind of rough and tumble poetry and stuff like that, or poetry that's a bit more for the everyman. Definitely not. I love how when poetry is rough and tumble, it's still so, so pretty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely, right? It's, to, to me, you'll only get that kind of poetry starting after the Second World War kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or, or at least the like first. the first. Yeah, yeah, I would say the First or Second World War, it kind of secure, uh, secures itself. It's being like, truly that, rough and tumble. That kind of experience definitely creates that. Now, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever at all call any of this the every man's poetry. Anyway, so they're, they're trying to rival British poets, popular ones at the time, like Tennyson, who, for my money, you should definitely read more than Longfellow, but oh that's God, just yeah. my opinion. The only one of these guys that you should be reading a lot of is Hawthorne. Yeah, okay, so great. <laughs> Why Hawthorne in particular? He's just, if you haven't read Hawthorne before, he's just a He's just a good writer. He's a good American literary writer. And more importantly, he's not trying to, 
he doesn't romanticize tragedy as much. And okay, yeah, definitely. As long as long, just to harp on Longfellow just a little bit more, because he makes <laughs> it he makes it so easy. Mm-hmm. Originally, he tried to get Hawthorne to write this story. Exactly. Well, I think so. Hawthorne originally gave him the idea for the story, mm-hmm. and then Longfellow took it researched it basically looked into it and then tried to convince hawthorne to write it yeah and then to convince him to write it he was like i'm gonna write a big epic poem that's gonna become one of the most well-known pieces of anything related to the acadians to show you how it could be done (laughs) yeah what a guy what a guy and then that's uh, some like that's some big (laughs) energy right there as far as I know, also, Hawthorne never wrote anything like that. I don't think he actually wrote an Acadian story or poem, actually. So he oh. just, like, out Hawthorne Hawthorne. Mm-hmm. Why would you try after this guy just writes this huge story, you know? Exactly. Especially that Evangeline had, was in an immediate success. Like, mm-hmm. it was immediately recognized as not only something important, but, like, was immediately grabbed onto, as we'll talk about, by the Acadians themselves. Like, they'll, they'll definitely grab onto this. So, at some point, you've just, like, you immediately struck gold, right? <laughs> so, why, why would you even try? You can make something more interesting, of course, but, like, at this point, it would just seem derivative, I guess, to try, for Hawthorne to suddenly do something with the Acadians, mm-hmm. I guess. I guess that was the idea, or he just didn't care enough anymore. Right? That's totally fine. Also, that's true. I, I mean, why would you at this point? Not right. to like be mean to the Acadians, but that's just the mindset of other people to them, you know. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, do you want to? Uh, I don't know. Did you read actually Hawthorne's initial story that he told Longfellow that influenced the writing of the poem? No, I, I put a little excerpt of it on the on our notes. Oh no, which one is it? Oh, so oh my god. It's, it's strikingly like Evangeline. So Nathaniel Hawthorne invites Longfellow for a dinner basically one evening, and he tells him the story of Acadia. Right? And keeping in mind the summary that we gave of, of Evangeline, and we'll touch upon specific passages soon, like keep in mind the summary that we gave. And so this is the story that Hawthorne told him. Quote, on their marriage day, all the men of the province were summoned to assemble in the church to hear a proclamation. When assembled, they were all seized and shipped off to be distributed through New England. Among them, the new bridegroom, his bride set off in search of him, wandered about New England all her lifetime, and at last, when she was old, she found her bridegroom on his deathbed. The shock was so great that it killed her likewise. So basically, he just like ripped off the same story and made it into a hundred pages long instead of eight lines. Mm -hmm. Again, much more beautiful than this story because we're condensing it down. But, you know, that's a very clear influence on him. There's also another noted influence that we should point to. And that's our dear old friend and the one of the first topics that we covered together, Mac, T.C. Halliburton. Hey, isn't he the clock guy? Yeah, so he wrote The Clockmaker, but before he wrote The Clockmaker, he actually wrote historical books, right? Mm -hmm. And his most important being one that was called A Historical and Statistical Account of Nova Scotia, which which sounds like the driest history that you can write, and indeed it really is. Halliburton writes this in 1829. It mentions the Acadians in it, but, you know, he, expen- he mentions their expulsion, uh, Halliburton being who he is, right? A very much, very much an Anglophile. He isn't very brutal on the British, right? He doesn't really criticize much of their actions during this expulsion. Uh, if you read like the, the, the account, the, statistic, the whole historical account of Nova Scotia, it's a very small section. It doesn't really cover much of the ins and outs. It works for what he's trying to do, but he's, he's very easy on the British, mm-hmm. which is not surprising, but, you know, this was a very popular book and one that Longfellow has noted, was noted to have read and used as an influence for this book. And we'll get to how that kind of plays out, maybe. So those are like the two noteworthy influences. Yeah. Note that there are no like primary sources for Evangeline. Like, he doesn't, as far as I know, talk to any Acadians. He doesn't actually, I don't think he even went to Nova Scotia. Or if he did, it was for a very Ooh, short period oh, of time. Oh, look at the pretty fish. 
<laughs> but like he basically bases himself off of these two secondary or tertiary argument, uh, you can make the argument, sources that one of them is an American, one of them is a British imperialist. Well, it's also just the story he's using is not like, it's not even original by Hawthorne and Halliburton. Again, no. this, this plot of these two lost lovers searching for each other, it's Pericles, Prince of Tyr, written by William Shakespeare. Yeah, it's like the most basic story that you can find. The only more, the only romantic story that could be more basic is Romeo and Juliet, also yeah, written by exactly. William Shakespeare. <laughs> and in the end, they all, they both also die. So like, mm -hmm. but I guess that's like a good place to start is, so this is, as we were, we we're kind of alluding to, it's essentially like a romantic tale. It's stretched out over about 110 pages, but the, the, the kind of through line of it is lost lovers. Uh, trying to reunite do, do you think that this is an interesting choice to make like of all the ways that you could frame such a story oh god no it's the that... most generic way to frame the story ever mm -hmm. i get like i get why he does it it's it, it's a it's an easy way to establish human connection and i'm, I'm yeah. all i'm always all for using cliches absolutely i think if done well they can be very useful but there's the implementation here was a little lacking. Again, I can see that it could work on many levels. Mm -hmm. right? If you're trying you can... to write a historical narrative, I don't know if the lost lovers is the best way to get the human aspect. No, I don't think his intention was writing necessarily a purely historic thing, right? Because he was no. part of a group of poets that were very sentimental at a time that was very much emphasizing romantic styles of poetry i think i think this is a necessarily a product of its time right and the styles of poetry that was uh, that were known at the time i think it could have been handled better because you can make a love story interesting because you can have this parallel as she's simultaneously looking for her love and trying to recapture this image or this perfect young image of her lost acadia but then why, why, if he's going for romanticism, why choose the topic of the deportation of the Acadians as your backdrop? Yeah. Is, that a, is that a really, like, a romanticism setting right there? I think for him, in some sense, it's the fact that they remained, right? There were some that were left, and they still held out as this community, granted of, like, a couple thousand, but they still held out as this community, and it shows a kind of hope, right? That you can... You can hopefully, you can hold on to these images and you can hold on to this hope of refinding past glory. I think that's what he's going for. But I agree, it's weird. Romantic poetry has always been one of those things that baffle. I mean, I can get other parts of it because if you look at other parts of romantic poetry, they're concerned with things of the sublime yep. nature poetry, the use of the imagination. It just seems a weird option from a stylistic perspective to then take that and try and place it onto a mass deportation of people in the colonies. You know, he, he would be better served trying again to write nature poetry of a lived experience in the colonies of yeah. a trip of some kind rather than trying to lay a romanticism on top of this historical event. I think part of it, as we mentioned, comes from the inherent style of the poem, right? You mentioned it was written in a hexameter, right? It's essentially oh, yeah. it's the same writing style, the same form, sorry, as you'll find with epic poetry. So you're trying to create this brig sprawling narrative, but also, you know, <laughs> the, the, the passage that Matt quoted at the beginning of the primeval forest and all that, this Edenistic version of Acadia, this kind of description lasts for about four pages right, it's of long. just description of the pretty scenery. You're completely removing the human element that you're trying to capture by being romantic and sentimental. Right? So right from the get-go, it kind of loses, I think, its potency for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I guess, like, coming off of the form, to <laughs> me, this kinds of re this, this reads a bit messily, right? I, I know it's meant to be structured, but reading this, it doesn't, it doesn't hit the same beat notes as you would when you read, like, the, Greeks, the, the Greek and Latin poetry that he's trying to imitate. Mm-hmm. And so it, for me, and rather than coming off as rhythmic and well thought out, it just comes off as messy, which I mean, 
I would almost credit it with, like, I would almost say like, good, you're doing something interesting because you're through the form, you're representing some, the, the messiness of her life, of the Acadians kind of crumbling. But that was that point. Yeah, exactly. That wasn't the point. <laughs> he wasn't actually trying to do that. So any, any attempt that I could make with justifying that just completely fails. <laughs> he was just being pretentious. He was a he was a pretentious poet purporting to present a picture of the population. <laughs> yeah. So do you, I guess do you want to go off of that again? Like, did you have anything to add to that? Well, it's because we could see it. I, I think you could make the argument of the messiness being part of it because it's not always about what the author intends in the writing what we pick up on it later sure but the more and more you look at the outside sources of evangeline and the way he talked with halliburton and hawthorne it really feeds into this idea that any sort of representation of the messiness was it was unintentional it was something that just sort of happened as he's trying to copy this meter and again i think it relates back to the content because writing this big hexameter story, you can do it with something like Odysseus or Ulysses, which is a messy tale in of itself because it's a magical tale. Mm -hmm. It's a mythical tale. and this Because that's what he's trying to emulate right now. He's trying to emulate these older stories. I mean, you could also, you can do that while still being different and brilliant. If you mm -hmm. want to continue on the idea of Ulysses, James Joyce did exactly what you're describing, but he did it I was that thinking was in, that, yeah. in, in a way that was freaking awesome. If you say so. Yeah. Hey, no, we, okay, we're not going to start this now. I love James Joyce and you are not going <laughs> to bash him on this show. I know. I'm not going to, I don't, I don't bash him because I think he's bad or not. I can't judge that part. I just bash him sometimes because it gets you going. And regardless of what you say, I will edit it out. I have that power. I can censor you as much as I want. That's true. And I'm not involved <laughs> in the editing process and I don't listen to this afterwards. So, like, you could you could switch what I'm saying with the sound of a jackass braying in the morning, and it would be the I wouldn't know. Little do you know, that's exactly what I do every episode. The con again, like Ulysses is a good example because he what to me this shows Longfellow missing the point of the story. Okay, he was more interested in doing the same style without realizing that it was the themes, the content, and the structure and the pacing mm -hmm. that was that's what that's the part that set Homer apart. You know. Definitely. That's why we can reproduce something like the Odyssey and Ulysses over and over and over again and still be enraptured by it. Yeah. It, you can't it, reproduce Evangeline. No. But you, there have been attempts in like song and stuff like that, but it's hella weird. <laughs> but yeah, it, at that point you get into like questions of archetypes and stuff like that. But yeah, I think oh, you wow. definitely bring up what... It was the first Canadian feature film, Evangeline, in 1913. No way! Yeah... I don't know how I feel about that. Although it does perfectly fit in with the type of films that we were making at the time, which were very moralistic. Yeah. Um, and we can get into that. Um, well, actually, we can get into it right now because kind of going off of this idea, you bring up an interesting point of the themes, right? Mm -hmm. I think we, we've been kind of bashing on the the inherent premise of the the poem oh we can but, bash on the themes too look uh, but uh, that's the thing i'm, I'm gonna say is that i think he's doing some interesting stuff with this oh for sure the idea of themes and symbols actually does do some interesting stuff now mm -hmm. his execution of it can be can leave to be desired uh, but so for example, here I'm on page 33 of my copy, but for example, he kind of foreshadows, by the way, we're on page 33 and the British still have not arrived, but <laughs> the, um, th this is basically two Acadians talking. If I remember correctly, it was Evangeline's dad and Gabriel's dad. And they're recounting a story of a stolen necklace and come to find out that the person who that was kind of jailed and punished for this, this stolen necklace, turns out they didn't actually do it and it was just lost on a statue of justice. Here we go. I'll just read a bit of it here. Raised aloft on a column, a brazen statue of justice stood in the public square upholding the scales in its left hand and in its right a sword as an emblem as an emblem that justice presided over the laws of the land in the hearts and homes of the people in the course of time the laws of the land were corrupted might took the place of right and the weak were oppressed and the mighty ruled with an iron rod 
Then it chanced in Enobolin's palace that a necklace of pearls was lost, and ere a suspicion fell on an orphan girl, who lived as maid in the household. She, after a form of trial condemned to die on the scaffold, met her doom at the foot of the statue of justice. And in the hollow thereof was found the nest of a magpie, into whose clay-built walls the necklace of pearls was interwoven. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think this is kind of interesting because it foreshadows like the defeat of justice, right? Or it foreshadows this kind of... The destruction, dismantlement of the justice. Yeah, exactly. In a way that's kind of interesting. But to, to, to me, the, the, the analogy with the British is kind of lost. This specific example to me just kind of doesn't really represent exactly what the British were doing, right? So that's what I mean when I was saying he doesn't really follow through properly with... No, the, the, I, the symbolism, and I do like the idea. I like the ideas in using the statue as justice and sort of this idea that it's an in, it's an inanimate object, mm -hmm. but live justice in action reports to be something much uglier. Yeah, and I think that's a very interesting thing to talk about. But he lacks the follow through. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, got a good backswing, but the, that follow through, man. If we if we want to talk about. Uh, depiction. I think this kind of helps in to bring us uh, bring us into the depictions of the people themselves, right? Because we're talking about the more general aspects of the poem, right? Mm -hmm. The form, the symbolism. I think this kind of leads us nicely into how the actual history and the people are depicted. Right? I don't know how uh, if you read enough to kind of make a judgment on it but how do you find that the acadians say for let's let's start off how do you what do you think of the way that they're depicted themselves right or oh wait where was the community? line that i saw this this is in the beginning for folks mm -hmm. who don't know this is i don't have page numbers but this is in like the little prologue part where's the thatch ruth village the home of acadian farmers men whose lives glided on like rivers that water the woodlands darkened by shadows of earth but reflecting an image of heaven waste are those peasant farms and the farmers forever departed he's got this very sort of condescending view yeah i guess you could say of the acadians okay. where it's as if like it's all these little villages are so cute and wonderful and not this is they're not actually their homes that they lost and he's the first thing he talks about in waste is waste of the fields and the farms not the waste of the life the culture that was lost it's the resources that were lost that's important the, throughout the poem there's a sense of inevitability and fate that kind of permeates i think that ties in directly to what you're saying right he's not blaming well in a sense he is but he, he he seems to be removing some of the blame of human cruelty in this case or imperial cruelty mm -hmm. and almost shifting the idea towards exactly what you're saying of well you know the land wasn't used properly and as i was saying there's this idea of fate where you know the british are quoted as following orders the on the a priest, great noble cause exactly right this great noble cause which he doesn't necessarily quote but you definitely get that sense we can talk about the british soon i have some passages but you know the, 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 there's this imagery of the clock that parallels uh, Evangeline's father having a stroke. Right? There, there's these ideas that remove the element of human choice, right? of compassion, of potential compassion. Right? And it just says, well, you know, this is what happens when you don't use things properly. Right? If you <laughs> misuse your toys, we're going to take them away. Right. He kind of washes his hands of the British cruelty, I find. Oh, for, I, I, yeah. Again, right. it, it's all, it all, it all isn't just part of trying to create this romantic sort of sense of the tale. And I definitely get the idea of you're starting with, you want to talk about the land that was lost and all these poor things that have gone to waste. Mm -hmm. But his focus, I, I personally believe, is in the wrong section. Okay. Where would you put it instead? Well, no, it's him. I mean, his focus should be on the people. And he almost yeah. gets there. Men whose lives glided on like rivers that water the woodlands, darkened by shadows of earth, but reflecting an image of heaven. He starts, so this perfect little section in Compulus is little encapsulates what he was talking about. Because mm -hmm. he starts and he's talking about the people, but then he kind of loses it. And it's a, and then it becomes oh these it's a darkened spot now but it ref, but it's reflecting an image of heaven as if like the people aren't there anymore so therefore it's a reflection of heaven now question sure. mark yeah as in the people were somehow tainting it 
but it's it's just this in general he's very it's there's a lot of confusion and a lack of clarity of what he wants to actually be talking about yeah definitely he put the cart before the horse yeah because not long after not long after your passage that you just quoted right in the pages following he talks about more about like the way in which the city fun- or, the, or at least the town the community functions in grand prix mm-hmm. and he mentions you know that they're mostly farmers and they're very good people they dwelt in a simple life in simple houses thus in- dwelt together in love these simple acadian farmers dwelt in the love of god and of man yeah. Alike were they free from fear that reigns with the tyrant and envy, the vice of republic. Is that the passage you were going for? Uh, I mean, it was one of them. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Did I steal the thunder a little bit? No, it's fine. We talked about it before, right? But there's almost an el- right, the You mentioned the vice of republics. There's almost an element of criticism of ways in which... I'm sorry? I was just saying, because he's very much praising a simple life as if civilization is there for the enemy. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's, that's kind of what I was really circuitously aiming towards, but exactly that. I just beat through the bush, man. I don't beat around it. Honestly, that's good because without you, this show would last like three hours. No, it's exactly that. You're, you're setting up this Eden, right? This paradise, literally referencing heaven. And we can get to the religious imagery if you want, but the... I mean, her name's Evangeline. Yeah. Okay. And the angel Gabriel... Yeah, the, the, the references to the priest often, like we can... The people that were removed from their homes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can definitely get some big Jewish vibes there. Oh, just the, it's not just Jewish. It's that's the Old Testament in general. That's the entire yeah, that's story true. of Eden. Yeah, that's true. And you have to wonder, because the whole idea with Adam and Eve is they did something to deserve it by eating the apple of wisdom. The Akkadians just existed. They ate the wisdom of neutrality to, of neutrality and being able to harvest their land in a way that wasn't completely destructive to the land. Yeah, they, they, they literally did nothing. And for that, they were kicked out of their Eden. They're supposed to Eden, mm-hmm. except Longfellow's forgetting that they made the Eden. God did yeah. not make Eden for the Acadians. The Acadians made Eden for themselves. I do like, by the way, the, the religious emphasis as an idea. Oh, right. yeah. I always love me some religious symbolism. Right. Because, and also because it kind of encapsulates, and he kind of uh, does this uh, pretty interestingly, of how the community relates to the authority of religion, right? Which mm-hmm. is something that you see in a lot of, you know, European communities of the time. They had a strong religious association, whether it was Catholic or Protestant or whatever you want to do, right? Right. And so I think he does manage to capture that quite interestingly. Right, the even right, the, you, the it opens one of the first lines that we get the priest with. The people are bending over and kissing his hand. He clearly has some kind of moral and virtuous authority over the Akkadian people. Mm-hmm. And something that I really find interesting is the priest's relation to the British, right? Which is not like super explicitly stated, mm-hmm. but is very much indicated in the sense of when people start panicking obviously because the british are deporting them he's the one who takes the stance of you know just calm down take it easy we'll figure it out let's not be too harsh towards the british which is actually something that you saw quite a bit of in places like new france right where a lot of the religious authorities would be more willing to not necessarily back the British, but be bas- passive towards them, right? Because and, it didn't rock the boat as much, and it allowed them to continue to live in air quotes. And I also like this idea that it's sort of, at this point, there's sort of the mentality of being British is more of a fanatic religion than it is a nationality. If you're not with us, you're against us and all that yeah. sort of stuff. The col- and the colonies are some sort of great holy war that's going on. Mm-hmm. So having this sort of parallel between the priests trying to get them to follow the british orders is kind of interesting i think that was a well-written bit a well-written spot yeah i'll try to find it exactly and just in general i think again religious symbolism is good i think it's just longfellow forgets certain things and it is interesting to play with the again the idea of god as empire and they are but again they are free from their republic Mm -hmm. so it gives this sort of anti-british sentiment a bit yeah while also not being anti-british well, being, again, kind of passive towards it. You don't want to rock the boat too much. 
Yeah, I want you want to make the next great piece of American literature, but it can't rock the boat. <laughs> so, like, we'll just be kind of derivative. We'll it's just be fun. really. We'll just gonna throw in like a thousand words to talk about one thing, and then nobody will notice. They'll just be looking at the pretty stuff so long. Yeah, the the passage I was talking about, by the way, with the priest is um, spake he after the toxins alarum distinctly. He he clock strikes. What is this that ye do, my children? What madness has seized you? Forty years of my life have I labored among you and taught you not in word alone, but in deed to love one another. Is this the fruit of my toils and my vigils and prayers and privations? Have you so soon forgotten all lessons of love and forgiveness? Mm -hmm. I find this really cool, not just for what we were talking about earlier, but because this to me shines through more as something that indicates look what happens to people when as soon as something changes right or something chaos yeah right as, as soon as there is no or as soon as the moral authority is kind of lost or is threatened then this kind of chaotic thing happens and you know i think this this allows us to come back to the way that the british were depicted as almost following orders right as this sense of saying well look we are the new moral authority but if you just let things be kind of like what they were doing initially in actual history just saying like here just let us control you it's let fine it just be. don't resist let it be let then, it be let it be then everything's going to be fine whispering words of wisdom let it be let it be while the house burns down around them <laughs> Yeah, right. The British saying something like this. Um, you are convened on this day, he said. This is the commander. You are convened on, he, on the day, he said, by his majesty's orders. Clement and kind has he been. But how you have answered his kindness, let your own hearts reply. To my natural make and my temper, painful the task is I do, which to you I know must be grievous, yet must I bow and obey and deliver the will of our monarch." Namely, that all your lands and dwellings and cattle of all kind forfeited be to the crown. God grant you may dwell there ever as faithful subjects, a happy and peaceable people. I think this just kind of encapsulates everything we were saying from the beginning. <laughs> you can tell Longfellow really, what he really wants to talk about is the romance stuff. Mm -hmm. But he knows he has to write about all this other stuff going around too. Mm -hmm. It seems like he wants to tell almost three different stories. Yeah. That, that, that's really what it seems like. The difference is it removes from the impact of it, right? If you're just splitting up a bunch of things, mm -hmm. you completely remove from the hostility of the British because you're trying to frame it as this utopian place with a romance. So it can't clash too much with that idea, but you're just making it a bit saccharine. Mm -hmm. it, it, to me, it completely loses its potency no matter any valiant attempt that he could have made. No, I, I, I definitely follow what you're saying, you know? Mm -hmm. He's, it's all gotten out of hand. Do you think it would have been better? Like, do you think his writing style and his attempt at making an epic would have been better if he had just concentrated on one of those ideas? Oh, for sure. Okay. I think, I think there definitely was potential because he obviously is a good writer. Mm -hmm. Like from the very standpoint of he knows how to put words together in such a way to evoke an emotional response. Yeah. And I think if he stripped down his ideas and focused on one of them, he would have told a much more concrete and well-written tale. Mm -hmm. Again, not to harp on it, but again, the the story of Odysseus, which he's sorry, or the Aeneid by Virgil, mm -hmm. they are one story. They are about Odysseus trying to get home. They are about uh, what's the guy? The guy who's Romulus and Remus progenitors. Aeneas. Aeneas. It's about Aeneas finding founding Rome. There's mm -hmm. not this two, three, four, five other stories going on. There's one story that then allows for branching themes and discussions. Yes. Because Meanwhile, he has, goes on. Yeah. <laughs> he has a lot of branching themes and discussions that are then trying to make one story. Totally. And like, to me, I, th I think it would have already been more interesting if, even if you wanted to keep a lot of threads going, right? I think it would have been more interesting to me if he had folk, if, even if he had spent a lot of time describing I think it would have already been more interesting to me if he had actually described what Acadian settlements looked like, mm. right? because you don't really get a sense of what their community, what their culture is. Yeah, you get this idea that they are Catholic, 
yeah, you get this idea that actually you don't really get much of a sense that they speak French. <laughs> you don't get any of the things that make them this interesting population to talk about, but you get a lot of passages just on the freaking primeval forest. <laughs> French squares. <laughs> yeah. So already just shifting that perspective, I think, would have been radically more interesting. Yeah, but if you're going to talk is, about Acadians, like you have to know what you're talking about. Otherwise, people will figure it out. Yeah. But at the time, I don't think people did just because they had been reduced to such numbers that... Yeah. It, and he got they, away with it. Yeah. You could get away with it. Again, Which is now why I think the discourse is changing. Yeah. Because we have more Acadians and there's more people willing to sort of take a look at this realistically and say, hold up, this isn't true. Mm -hmm. It's well, the same thing that happened with the with Pocahontas and John Smith in that it got to such a point and then Disney made the movie. And after that, First Nations communities in the same area and would have been part of the same people took a look at it and said, okay, we really need to start getting this under like control. But I mean, I guess that's a, unless you have anything more specific to say about the poem, I think we can like properly shift to its aftermath Let's because I think that's a bit more interesting than the poem itself. I think everything surrounding the poem generally is more interesting than the work itself because you can't mm -hmm. tell a lot just from it. So as we said, in 1847, this work comes out. By this point, it has been a hundred years that the Acadians were deported, were went through that horrible ordeal, and they're slowly building back up, but clearly in the face of a British hegemony in North America, or just an <laughs> English-speaking hegemony, mm -hmm. a small community of a couple thousand people in the Maritimes, and that by this point it was separated between New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia, was not going to be developing that massive a culture, right? Mm -hmm. They had probably a lot more to figure out than what their next great piece of literature was going to be, right? Namely, the survival of their community among this kind of British hegemony, which is something that you hear all the time, all the way to this day, by the way. Point is... British hegemony. <laughs> the, the, the point is, Evangeline is kind of interesting in that it comes out right around the time that you get you get general a general increase in french canadian settlements in like quebec and manitoba right with the metis and you suddenly get this piece right by an american but still that talks about this community that is that has been kind of struggling to get back up on its feet for about a hundred years it's been kind of in the shadows it's been living but it hasn't been like really on the scene and so what this kind of does is that after selling really, really well, enough to warrant many, many translations within the decade in German, Italian, Polish, French, right, you kind of see this renewed interest in Akkadian literature and Akkadian culture. Right? Mm -hmm. So say what you will about Evangeline as a text. Right. It definitely is romantic. It definitely doesn't hit on the necessarily the good things that you'd expect from a writer trying to salvage a culture. Right. But it is interesting insofar as it allows for a renewed interest and it kind of brings attention and a renewed vigor to a community that was kind of struggling after, after the 1760s. So I think that's really quite interesting. I don't know, uh, the, obviously there's more to talk about, but do you have any like initial thoughts about that? About how there's more to talk about or? <laughs> about like its initial revival of Acadian culture and Acadian uh, communities. Again, I think there is an interesting discussion you can have and how it served that purpose, mm -hmm. but you have to wonder how positive it really sort of was. Again, going back to the example of Pocahontas, mm -hmm. yes, it was involved in the first nations and telling a first nation story but the way it was done yeah did in many ways could be argued did more damage interesting yeah because and this is kind of like a debate within academia oh, from what sure. i saw it's it's kind of debatable whether evangeline created this national pride or pushed it right or it kind of fomented this pride that was already forming in the midst of all these french canadian sentiments and really just dialed it up. You know, this Canadian pride in an Acadian poem written by an American, beautiful. 
that's some that's some Canadian nationality right there. Yeah, exactly. But I think it's it's important to talk about the fact that yes, it can be detrimental, but it at least allowed for the conversation to happen. And you can say the same thing about Pocahontas. Oh, for sure. Like definitely there are some problems with the original story and the Disney version and all kinds of things like that. The idea, however, is that at least you have something which you can then work with, right? Mm -hmm. And actually expand upon or change, right? Or you can actually make it part of your culture to say, okay, well, let's disprove the fact that we're like a bunch of farmers who don't really, who don't really get with the modern program. We're just a bunch of backwards farmers who speak French in an English province, right? It's not. <laughs> and, but that's but, academia. If, if, if I had an, a series of Acadians who then came up and said, we want this to stop being the representation of our culture, mm -hmm. I can't see anything wrong with them saying that. No, absolutely not. I think we have to separate that discussion of academia reactions and public reactions. Well, that's interesting that you mentioned that because popular reactions at the time kind of embraced it. Oh, yeah. So at the time, any representation would be a good representation and people were still like education for the for the masses was still on the rise. So a lot of people would still sort of be coming into this. They would still be developing an idea of critical thought. Yeah. And well... Regardless of whether you engage with it critically, it it was kind. It did essentially kind of become a folk tale, right? Which is not really meant. When you see something as a folk tale, you can engage with it critically, but the myth of it becomes more powerful than any critical engagement that you can have, right? Because it offered a powerful, if completely inaccurate, definition of the Acadians' past, right? As something that's lost and can be regained suddenly the image of Evangeline became something that everyone could rally around, right? And build something new about it. So you had like newspapers with her name on it. You, there was like an entire tourism as the 20th century rolled around that was built around it as seeing the quote unquote land of Evangeline, right? Her name and her image became synonymous with Acadia, right? As this mm -hmm. pure figure, as this figure that's untouched by modern society, right? This figure that can still represent a moral high ground in, right, uh, in, in a world that was increasingly moving away from natural sentiments, right? These, these ideas like we were going through industrialization, imperialism and stuff like that. I think it offers a powerful image and you, you know, you, you still, I, I don't think the power of right, the statues that were put up of her can be underestimated oh, right? in, terms sure, no. of, in terms of, uh, in terms of pride and, but if you're going to talk about statues, we have to talk about how statues are being seen today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do it. think there's a lot of consideration we have to put in, into how Evangeline is treated today and also how that can change. We can't necessarily say that how she was viewed in the past is how she always has to be viewed. No, at all. Right. So that, I, I guess that's a good way of, to transition as any because, right, this growth of a national myth kind of kept going until... The 1950s, especially in Nova Scotia, where Grand Prix is, right? It would develop a bit differently in Acadian communities in New Brunswick and in Prince Edward Island, right? There, there's kind of distinctions and they'll develop cultures in their own right uh, uh, throughout the 19th century. We can eventually talk, for example, about works like La Seguin, which is about New Brunswick and is much funnier, by the way, than Evangeline. And it's really quite a, <laughs> it's, it's really quite a fun read. It's a, it's a theater play. It's a one person theater play. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so great. I love it. But, you know, the, you kind of have these developments that occur uh, a bit differently throughout the maritime provinces, but this national myth of Evangeline, this image of Evangeline, really wouldn't start to go away or disappear as we know it today until the 1950s. Right? And what you bring up, right, you keep mentioning the modern perceptions of it, which is a very good point because I asked a friend of mine who is Acadian, right, a Nova Scotian Acadian, who I met while I was working with Parks Canada. And I asked her, I was like, you know, how is Evangeline treated today? Like, what's the general perception of people from our generation, right? Uh, Gen X, millennial, that kind of thing. Mm. Is, is it still some uh, uh, an image that you kind of gravitate around? Is it something that you know, still holds 
any potency as it did in the 19th century, right? In sparking, for good or ill, this revived sense of a community. And her answer was kind of interesting because it's kind of a double-edged sword. I mean, yes, the statues are still up, right? And Mm -hmm. as you said, you can talk about statues forever about what they represent. And she was mentioning, for example, that in her elementary school, there was this parade that was done during which grade four students would, there, there, there were some that were elected as an Evangeline and a Gabriel for a day. And it's all kind of very folksy. There's not much importance laid against it. But she mentioned a modern writer that I think is really interesting. And she said, you know, this kind of represents more of what we think about Evangeline, Evangeline. today. Mm. And she, she linked to a poem by Celeste Godin. I got the poem up. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, and this poem by Celeste Godin was, was written a couple of years ago in 2015. It was posted on our blog. I'll link it in the description below. What's it called, Mac? <laughs> <laughs> if, you don't, if, you, if you have sensitive ears and do not like the extended use of crude language yep. you might want to cover them for a second mm-hmm. the name of the poem is fuck you evangeline and it opens like this fuck fuck you fuck you evangeline fuck you evangeline fuck you because you are the romantic fantasy of an american man he ejaculated you all over the primeval forest you are our sex symbol you are a clean virgin looking for a man instead of looking for herself fuck you evangeline fuck you because you had become the shorthand of my whole culture you are the fast food of acadia on every street corner we sell your tragedy but you don't really feed you make us obese it goes on like that for a while yeah and for those of you who tuned out due to crude language i was basically just saying the word fuck a lot <laughs> it, it is interesting to know and you'll see this if you click on the poem it's written in the local dialect mm-hmm. basically so there there are some english words in it but it's mostly written in like, acadian french so it'll get to yeah, i was reading the english yeah version. you you were translating it as you were going along right but it's like or google is translating it as I went along. <laughs> exactly it's things like il t'a ejaculé sur toute la forest primeval it, it's kind of like this mix of words and this local dialect which i think is a really interesting addition but yeah the the, the images that you brought up are exactly that And this is what we were kind of talking about and alluding to and that we are finally coming to terms with as a modern audience is that I think the idea of Evangeline being a sex symbol is exactly that. And as you say, Celeste compares her to a fast food chain Mm -hmm. that it feels good to eat it. But after that, you're kind of like, oh, there's no substance. Again, Evangeline looks very pretty. Not a lot underneath. No. And I, I, th- I can get, this is the anger I'm sort of getting about in the popular consensus. We can debate the academia all day long, but if this is how the people are reacting, this is going to be the reaction that sticks mm-hmm. in this sort of, again, you're being, it's like, if you think of America and think of the McDonald's arches and that's your first sort of thought, Yeah, it's sort of, you can, you can see why people would not want to be represented in this one way. Or if, again, Canada is hockey or Quebec, you represent us with a patine or something. Mm-hmm. We all live in igloos. Yeah. We ride moose. Yeah. Moose? Moose eye? Moose. But <laughs> the, 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 the point remains Moose-in. regardless. Like it feels good and you can create these images all you want. I think these images go a very long way. I think they have their relevancy and I think at best they're a spark. They should not be what creates a whole culture no i think if you liked evangeline really take the time to be that to make that your gateway into actually studying the acadian culture exactly right and the variety of acadian culture like we've been talking about acadians as if they're just the maritimes but really again louisiana maine texas they're all over the place acadians are its own culture its own people Mm -hmm. absolutely i just wanted to cap off with one last thing unless you have other stuff to talk about but i wanted to cap off with one last thing there's a song that came out around 2007 named evangeline by a francophone singer called annie blanchard this to me perfectly represents how the sentimentalism of it plays to modern audiences i'll try to link it in the show notes at least for a couple or i'll try to link it in the show notes and put a clip of it in the actual recording to to me it this sounded so I don't want to say saccharine, but it um, the, the word in French would be like, cheesy is the word I'm looking for. Okay. And this kind of 
to me encapsulates exactly how Evangeline plays to modern audiences. It's they're trying really hard, right? And you blush mm-hmm. good on you. You're a good singer. You're trying really hard, but it just, there's a disconnect today with modern audiences. Right? You, you can debate forever the merits of it, right? In starting up this Acadian culture. And we might get to, we'll probably get to the actual developments of independent Acadian literature and culture that is dissociated from this American ideal of Acadians eventually. But I just wanted to end off with saying, you know, this is how it plays today. Is this really cheesy and kind of irrelevant version of the mm. poem? I don't know. Did you have any final thoughts? No, I think we've, <laughs> we've summed it up. We've summed it up into the, in its entirety. Yeah. Or not in its entirety, but we've summed <laughs> it up. It was kind of interesting because I, at first I was like, oh, you know, we could talk about you know, Evangeline, the, her representation as a woman and stuff like that. I was like, eh. it, again, for those who were expecting like much more of a deep dive into the poem, personally, I don't think there's that much to talk about the poem itself. It's more about everything surrounding it that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Because the ideas of the poem and what it's trying to present. Yeah, because you can talk about like the depiction of women, for example, and it, it's like, yeah, it's cool, but it's also exactly everything you'd expect from a poem of that time. Right. Which kind of relates back to what we were saying about the image of Evangeline. It's a pretty packaging, right? It, oh, that's, yeah. And that's exactly how Evangeline is played in the poem. Is like it's a pretty, it's a pretty package presented by a poem purporting to present the picturesque population of the past. There you go. I don't think we could end on better. Mac, why don't you tell everyone how they can support the show? Well, first of all, don't support the show. <laughs> don't know why you would. Honestly, just for psychology, activate. <laughs> you can or like support- subscribe for a month, download all the extra episodes, then unsubscribe before they charge you. That too. <laughs> it, really, what we want to say is if you have any concerns, comments, questions, reach out. We have Facebook page, we have a Twitter, we have emails you can reach out to. Yep. You can also support us by paying what you believe we are worth through PayPal. If you're worth, we're, if you think we're worth a shoe on the side of the road, that's fine. Yep, I think we are slightly more, <laughs> but you know, just you can also ever. go ahead and purchase the books we talk about from specific episodes through our website, and that gives us a little bit of a kickback, which is nice. If you want, again, learn more about the cultures we are purporting to talk about, this is all optional. Obviously, feel free to like, comment, share, subscribe, leave a review on iTunes to share with your friends, get the word out. Yeah. Any, anything you want, really. Do you, and what do we do over on Patreon? Well, over on Patreon, that's where I run the show. So things oh, yeah. get a little freaky. It's, it's arguably much, much better than Oh, this God, show no. Here. It's, <laughs> what happens on Patreon is the main series is, the, the main draw is you get access to the series Pop Canada, which is the series I write talking about Canada's pop cultural values and how Canada has sort of staked its own place and claim within the larger world of pop culture. The last episode was the Klondike Gold Rush and the discussion of the mythology of the event and how it sort of relates to the rest of Canada in its depictions. Oh boy, we've talked about the director Denis Villeneuve. Other perks on Patreon include you get full, the, is it the unedited version of the episodes? Completely uncut. Uncut early episodes, ad-free, anything you want. So yeah, it's, it's, it's Historia Canadiana, bigger, longer, and uncut. Exactly. If somehow, like an hour and a half show is not enough, you can get an hour and 45 minutes with extra jokes, I guess. Yeah. Uh, us <laughs> making mistakes and saying the wrong things and having to backtrack. <laughs> exactly. But it's fun. Like, if you want to get the show early, you can check it out there. We'll see oh. you next time on Historia Canadiana. Cheers, everyone. All right. See you all later. <laughs>